good evening, my fellow fun guys and fun gals. It's Len here, aka Oddmush. I hope that you're doing well this evening. Welcome to The Witcher 3, where we will be reading some of the books that you can find in the game. There are quite a few books to be read. I'm not sure if I will get to read them all. I hope so. I will do my best in the following reading videos to do more of these books and letters. For this first one I made an attempt to choose a few that kind of fit together thematically because it's mostly like the more geographical books so for today we will be reading the books what shall become of Tamaria Govir and Povis wonders of Zeracania the opposition in Nilfgaard Toussaint, a duchy out of tales of fantasy and wonder. Lands of the North, Velen. Pearls of the North, Oxenfurt. And Pearls of the North, Novigrad. So, first book. What shall become of Temeria? Temeria. A land where milk and honey once flowed. In what did she wrong the gods that they should treat her so cruelly? The pearl of the north to some, she proved a galloping range for Nilfgaardian cavalry to others. As a country, it had survived two previous wars against the empire. It was here that the war's bloodiest battles were fought. It was in Temeria where their most bestial deeds were wrought. It was Temerian civilians who bore the full brunt of these war's horrors. And bear them we did, bravely and steadfastly, until the demise of our great protector, King Faltest. Then Providence turned its fickle face from Temeria, murdered most treacherously, Faltest failed to leave Temeria a worthy successor. And so all manner of cur soon fell upon her, tearing her apart like so much carrion. She had no more allies then, none remembered that we had once been the armor protecting the north from the designs of the mad dancer, he who had the gravestones of his foes pounded into a ballroom floor. A free and independent Maria is no more. A dark-faced sun looms over her every rampart, yet we Tamarians live on, and always will. As long as folk believe, the usurper who took our beloved capital, Vizima, to treat as his property will forever peer over his shoulder in fear. For in the shadows lurks not one dagger, but the power of a nation of daggers, waiting to deal justice blow. The next book, Kovir and Povis. Kovir and Povis are without a doubt the richest realms in the north. Few today remember that this was not always the case, yet their poverty was once literally on everyone's lips in the form of now antiquated common sayings. As recently as in the days of Heribert the Quarrelsome, one spoke of a particularly impoverished person as being 
poorer than a mouse from Povis. Called bone broth Koviri delight and referred to beggars as Praxides after the bay along the shores of which these kingdoms lie. Similarly, few remember that a mere handful of generations ago, Kovir and Povis were still a part of Redania. King Radovid I, known as Radovid the Great, handed dominion over them to his hated brother Troiden, with one stipulation, that he never leave his newly acquired Dimin and not interfere in matters of state. Handing over this rocky scrap of far northern ground, where, the saying went, the year had two seasons, August and winter, was naturally meant as a cruel joke, a slap in the face for the overambitious Troiden. Yet time soon proved that Radovid the Great had made a grave error. Before long it was discovered that Kovir's bare rocks hid priceless treasure in the form of enormous deposits of precious metals and rock salt. This discovery in turn led to tremendous growth in productive industry. Mills, forges and workshops sprouted up like mushrooms after a hardy rain. Radovid III decided to correct his famous forebear's mistake and take back the northern frontiers of his kingdom. He was convinced the combined armies of Redania and its then ally Cadwen would quickly bring it this ever more audacious vassal in line. History took a different turn, however, and Kovir won a resounding, crushing victory. Radovid III was forced to sign the first treaty of Lan Exeter, granting Kovir independence while binding it to eternal neutrality, a promise Troiden's successors have kept with great diligence. Until recently, Kovir was ruled by Esterod Tyson, a king as wise as he was greedy. Yet his untimely demise did not stop his lands from continuing to develop and blossom. Koviri metallurgists proudly compete with the best Mahakam can offer. And many believe the University of Lan Exeter long ago surpassed the famous Oxenford Academy as the leading seat of higher learning in the north. And so it has come to pass that over the course of a few generations, the inhabitants of Kovir and Povis have turned from paupers into princes, from beggars into bankers. <clears throat> Just having a sip of water. Okay, that was the second book. Moving on to Wonders of Zeracania. During my many travels, I have seen countless extraordinary places. The primeval wilds of Brocolon, with trees so high their tips disappear in the clouds. Dwarven chambers carved into the guts of the Mahakam Mountains, with walls plated in pure gold. The ice palace of Ponfanis, adorned with stained frost windows. Yet none of these made such an impression on me as did the rightly famed Zeracania. Yet while I was traversing the fiery mountains, I feared disappointment awaited me on the other side. I had heard many a fanatic tale about Zeracania, about its trackless sands, burnt white by the sun, its golden-scaled dragons weaving their nests amid the dunes, 
its hunchbacked horses able to survive weeks without even a swallow of water. Yet none seemed to me at all plausible. I was sure all these sensations were but the figments of some bard's overactive imagination. I know this will be as hard for you to believe, dear reader, as it once was for me. But all of the unbelievable tales are true. Not only that, during my many months of travel, I came across wonders far surpassing those any prior travelogues mentioned. I saw temples dedicated to the worship of dragons. I heard their voice, almost human, but reverberating with a thousand echoes. I met warrior maids clad in leopard skins, tattooed from head to foot, and giving no ground to witchers in mastery of the blade. I saw mages who channeled power from fire. I saw seemingly harmless flies whose solitary bite would make a man fall into a deep slumber, never to awake save to die. In short, Seracania is a land where the fantastic is normal, and the impossible occurs daily. I started reading the the books of The Witcher not too long ago, although it's been a while since I <laughs> since I read it. I'm only in the first one. And they do speak of uh, a duo of Zeracanian female warriors. I don't know what you call a female warrior. Warrioress. Anyway. Next book is The Opposition in Nilfgaard. While Nilfgaard's emperor wields absolute power, Harshly crushing the slightest sign of disobedience, opposing forces continue to exist within the Empire. By this I do not mean the disgruntled leaders of conquered provinces, but the magnates within the city of a thousand towers who are unhappy with the current leadership. This conflict between the Emperor and the noble houses of Nilfgaard, the capital, dates back many years. All the princes of the blood and magnates expected their ruler to wed one of their daughters and sire an heir with one of their own. The emperor, however, had other plans. This proved a slap in the face for all the great families from which he refused to take a bride. The Nilfgaardian opposition patiently waits for the Emperor to slip up, for some event to occur which will weaken his authority, be it an economic crisis or a defeat in battle. A secret conspiracy lies ready to seize such a moment to incite the disaffected, assassinate the Emperor and carry out a coup d'etat, culminating with one of their own number ascending to the throne. For obvious reasons, only a limited few know of this conspiracy, but any shrewd observer of Nilfgaardian politics can read the signs of its workings. So long as men are men, and the world is as it is, certain dynamics will forever remain the same, and the discontented will always form subversive societies with their secret signs and hidden agendas. Maybe less of a, you know, geographical, touristy book. And now that I read this one, I think there was another one that maybe is not, you know, like purely geographical, but kind of geographically related. 
which is this one, the slaughter of Sindra. It's not that long, so it doesn't make a big difference. The cavalcade of riders pounded across the blood-soaked courtyard. They looked at no one and asked no questions. They knew exactly where they were going and why. To kill the old queen and capture the Sintran princess. As to what would become of her after that, no one would say. Calanthe and a group of her most loyal subjects had barricaded themselves inside the castle. They were protected by stone walls and a gate sealed by a spell, but they all realized neither would last long against a concentrated assault by the Nilfgaardian army and the mages supporting it. After four days, enemy soldiers forced their way inside. I thought there was another book about Sintra, but maybe I just saw the same book twice. So we shall move on to the next book, which is Toussaint, a duchy out of tales of fantasy and wonder. When a traveler from the northern realms first crosses the border into Toussaint, he feels at once as though he has stepped into a land ripped straight from the pages of a fantastic fairy tale. He will know no inclement weather there, for even the winters in Toussaint are mild and sunny, with only gentle, calming breezes and not a hint of gale. He will know no hunger, for the trees and bushes of that land burst with ripe and juicy fruits all the year long. He will know no loneliness, for each and every soul he encounters will treat him like a long-lost friend. He will not find a single backwater of dullness, boredom, or inquietude in this overflowing stream of marvel. In Toussaint, the wine rages in torrents, music plays ceaselessly, and everywhere the air is filled with the sound of birdsong and the twittering of beautiful maids, who are never stingy with their ample charms when a handsome knight comes a-calling. The capital of the duchy, Beauclair, is an architectural gem full of glorious elven monuments. Delicately soaring towers, masterfully carved reliefs, and atmospherically mysterious ruins. Only the rare sun in a field of black, the odd gold and dark stain on an otherwise pristine edifice, reminds one that this land this fable incarnate is a vassal of Nilfgaard. That's quite the praise for Toussaint. And to be honest, I can't wait to to return there in my playthrough. I haven't finished the main story yet and I just did, or I just started the first quest of Hearts of Stone. Um, and I intend to only go to Toussaint after I finished both the main story and Hearts of Stone, so might take a while. Okay, the next book, Lands of the North, Felon. But first, another sip. The land of Velen, located in western Temeria, with its capital in Gors Velen, is one of the poorest provinces in the kingdom. Its territory encompasses the Isle of Thanid, 
home to the famous Magic Academy, which, along with Gore's Velen, constitutes the commercial and developmental mainspring of the entire province. Velen is a stop on the Novigrad trade route running through Sidaris, Vergen, Bruges, Sintra, and other such southerly realms. Veliners subside primarily on agriculture, crafting, and animal husbandry. The province is practically deprived of all natural resources. It contains a great deal of forests, wetlands, and cultivated woods, though the greatest part of it is covered in swamps and bogs. It's the complete opposite of Toussaint. Not really a place you want to stick around long. Okay, and then the second to last book for today. Pearls of the North Oxenfurt. It's kind of a long text. Oxenfurt. A gem snuggling into the bosom of the Pontar to the east of Novigrad. A cradle erected upon Redadian soil, nurturing the greatest minds not only of that kingdom, but of all the north. To walk its hallowed academy's halls is to embark on a journey through learning, from the finest points of philosophy to the grandest strokes of art with stops made to admire architecture and dissect medicine along the way. Appear to either side and you will spy fellow travelers in your pilgrimage of learning, the students. They throng Oxenford's streets, lending it an indelible imprint of youth that can be felt the moment you pass through its gates. Dormitories stand cheek by jowl. Booksellers hawk used tomes on every corner. And under every tree, fresh faces debate poetry with passion. Yet youth is not all slate and compass. And the young here shirk none of its other typical pastimes. Raucous and merry are the city streets both by day and even more so by night. Though the city councillors have forbidden the sale of alcohol after dusk, no one seems eager to enforce this with stricture. And wisely so, for any loss of sleep is more than made up for by the gains. Profits to fatten its innkeeper's pockets. And the late night crooning of troubadours to enrich its soul. As for its architecture, of particular note are the recently renovated elven aqueducts used to clean the city sewers. They stand as witness to the city's innovative spirit. You will not find their like in all the civilized world. Yet dominating the town's architectural visage like a glistening crown is the complex of buildings that comprises the Oxenford Academy. Few today remember that these edifices, constructed by the elves, predate the city itself. It is the institution that named the city, and not vice versa. Today Oxenford Academy enjoys a reputation matched only by the Imperial Academy in Nilfgaard. Of greatest renown, the departments of alchemy, natural history, minstrelsy and poetry, medicine and herbology, engineering, and last but certainly not least, philosophy. I didn't know Oxenford was such a college town. <laughs> okay. But the last book for today will be Pearls of the North, Novigrad.
No one can claim to have traveled the northern realms who has not been to Novigrad. If I were forced to list what during my many meanderings has made the greatest impression on me, it would be precisely this great and yet at the same time free city. A metropolis worthy of the empire, its only flaw is that the civilization Nilfgaard carries within her has not yet enlightened it. That is why hordes of reactionary cultists of the eternal fire dwell in the midst of its excellent buildings and superb commercial infrastructure. One feels as though superstition is how the local hierarch and his temple guards cement their power over the city dwellers. And many they are to control, for the city counts no less than thirty thousands of inhabitants. While strolling through its fabulous port, surrounded by marvels of architecture, it is hard to imagine that centuries ago Novigrad was a mere minor elven townstead. When the city fell into the hands of the Nordlings, its problems grew exponentially. For as is well known, the people of the north can do a great many things, but peaceful and orderly cohabitation is not one of them. And so Novigrad first belonged to Redania, and then fell under Temerian rule, until finally, after endless compromises and bargains, it at last became a free city. But is the city truly free? I dare to doubt it. Redanian influence makes itself felt too strongly on every street corner, and the fact that the city is located within Radovid's territory speaks for itself. While wandering the city streets, I came across four water mills, eight banks, and nearly 19 pawn shops. There are also a great many houses of simple pleasures, such as taverns and brothels, and Novigrad's commitment to matters of faith is borne witness to by the fact that the city contains no less than, I kid you not, 19 temples to the eternal fire. What more can be said? I think Novigrad has all the makings of the capital of the world, and perhaps that is what it will one day become. First, however, someone needs to bring order to within her walls. Okay, that was the last book for today. I think I own most, if not all, of the books in the game. Um, but I'm not really sure. And <laughs> Honestly, I didn't want to wait till I completely finished the game. And I was sure I had as much as I could find, or I had found as much as I could find in terms of reading material. So yeah, there is still a lot more to read. I don't know if I will read every single text, but I'd like to try at least. Many of them are just short notes from treasure chests and like small side quests so i think it is actually less than it looks but yeah i don't know how i will structure the the following videos because there are some books about the wild hunt and like elves and stuff like that I think for the next videos I will just go through them in the order they are they are in here. I don't know when that will be. I will definitely play some more and try to find some more stuff to read. 
uh, with the characters I will also wait till I'm completely done with the game so as um, you know to make sure that the entries are as complete as they can be because they like, stuff gets added as you progress through the quests and through the story so yeah that is as much of a plan as I can <laughs> uh, promise to stick to but that will be it for this video I hope you enjoyed it it didn't turn out as long as I thought it might that's what she said um, if you enjoy these reading videos uh, please take a second to subscribe like comment all that stuff I really appreciate the support as always thank you very much for watching and for listening mostly for listening in this case and I will talk to you next time bye bye